queen of the track, Alice Coachman, Olympic high jump champion. Alice Coachman was born to run and jump. On morning walks with her great-grandmother, Rachel, Alice skipped ahead through the fields. She hopped on rocks. She vaulted over anything that got in her way. As Alice got older, her papa told her to stop running and jumping. In the 1930s, running and jumping weren't considered ladylike. Besides, as one of 10 children, Alice had lots of chores to do. She got up early to cook cornbread and eggs. After school, she washed the clothes and hung them to dry. She picked cotton and peaches with her older brothers and sisters and took care of the younger children. Still, all Alice could think about was running and jumping. So when she was done with her chores, she'd sneak off to play sports with the boys. People said she was a crazy fool and she knew Papa would punish her, but she couldn't pass up a chance to run and jump. In Albany, Georgia, like most of the South, black people didn't have the same rights as white people. Most white people wouldn't even shake hands with a black person. Blacks couldn't sit where they wanted on buses and they weren't allowed in many public places. There were no gyms, parks, and tracks where Alice could practice running and jumping. She didn't let that stop her. She ran barefoot on dirt roads. She collected sticks and tied rags together to make her own high jumps. Alice jumped so high, she soared like a bird above the cotton fields. When Alice was in seventh grade, the high school track coach noticed her talent. He convinced her parents to let her go with the team to the famous Tuskegee Relays in Alabama. There, she could compete against top black athletes from all over the country. For the first time in her life, Alice left Albany. She had never worn track shoes before or jumped over a real high jump bar. Alice won first place anyway beating high school and college girls. Alice didn't use her running talent only to win ribbons. One night in 1940, a tornado twisted into Albany, destroying homes and injuring many people. For two weeks, Alice volunteered as a rescue worker. She moved so fast she could deliver food while it was still hot. No one thought Alice was a crazy fool then. That year, the track coaches from the Tuskegee Institute persuaded Alice's parents to let her finish high school at Tuskegee. The all-black school was known for its excellent high school and college, as well as its athletes. Tuskegee gave Alice a scholarship to cover her tuition. In exchange for her room and board, she cleaned the gymnasium and pool and rolled the clay tennis courts and sewed uniforms. Alice missed her family and worried about them a lot. Without any money, they had a hard time staying in touch. Sometimes the coach gave Alice stamps so she could write to them. One time she went home for a surprise visit and her family had moved to a different house. Alice competed for both the track and field and basketball teams. Traveling to meets and games wasn't easy. Most restaurants and gas stations wouldn't serve black people. Once, when Alice won a race against a top-ranked white sprinter, someone in the stands threw ice at her. But Alice didn't let anything slow her down. The high jump, the 50-meter, the 100-meter, and the 400-meter relay, she won them all. She even led the basketball team to three straight championships. Alice had proved she was the best high jumper in the country and one of the fastest runners. She was ready to show the world what she could do at the Olympics. But it was 1944 and World War II was tearing Europe apart. During the conflict, the Olympic Games were canceled. When Alice was 23, she graduated from Tuskegee Institute's junior college and went home to Albany leaving the track team behind. Alice trained alone up and down the dirt roads, jogging, sprinting, jumping, 
Through the dust, she still kept sight of her Olympic dream. When the war was over, Alice finally had her chance. She qualified to high jump in the 1948 Olympics. Even though Alice had never lost a high jump competition before, she wasn't sure she could win this one. The years of hard training had weakened her back, and jumping was painful. But this was the chance she'd been working for all her life. With her Olympic teammates, Alice boarded the SS America bound for England. On the seven-day voyage across the ocean, Alice met people from all over the world. One night, the athletes were in charge of entertaining the passengers, so Alice performed a dance to St. Louis Blues. In London, Alice stayed with the other athletes on a college campus. They all lived together, black and white, joined by their dreams. The war had taken its toll on the city. Bombing had left the streets littered with piles of rubble. Most people in England faced serious food shortages. Alice and the other athletes were often hungry and thirsty. The cold English weather pricked her like pins, but Alice trained twice a day, and when she had time, she traveled around London and nearby towns, hopping from bus to bus. Alice could sit in any seat she wanted to admire the English countryside. Despite the hardships that people faced in London, the Olympic opening ceremonies were spectacular. Alice marched with the other athletes into Wembley Stadium to the applause of 85,000 spectators. The King of England proclaimed the Olympic Games open and thousands of pigeons took flight in the stadium. Alice had never seen so many birds soaring in the sky. Alice waited eight days for her turn to compete. One by one, her teammates lost their track events. With each loss, Alice became more determined. Whoever beats me better set a record, she thought. Alice was America's last hope for a gold medal in women's track and field. Her toughest competition was Dorothy Tyler from Great Britain. Inch by inch, they battled it out. Five feet three and two-fifths inches, five feet four and a half inches. The sand in the landing pit was thinning out, and the landings were tough on Alice's back. Five feet and five and a third inches. Even though it was getting late and all the other competitions were over, the King and Queen of England and thousands of spectators stayed to watch. At five feet six and an eighth inch, the bar was as tall as Alice. She never jumped that high in a competition before. Alice focused on the jump. She sprinted, pumping her arms. She pushed off and flew up, soaring over the bar. Her leap set a new Olympic record. Dorothy jumped and missed. But a jumper gets three chais to clear each height and Dorothy cleared the bar on her second attempt. The officials raised the bar to five feet seven inches. Alice jumped and missed. Dorothy missed too. After three attempts, neither athlete cleared the bar. Alice wasn't sure what would happen next. There are no ties in the high jump at the Olympics. Then she saw her name on the board. One coachman, United States. Alice won because she had made the record-breaking jump on her first try. On August 7, 1948, Alice Coachman from Albany, Georgia, became the first African-American woman to win an Olympic gold medal. As thousands cheered, she stepped on the podium. She had achieved her dream, a dream that started with a little girl running and jumping barefoot in the fields of Georgia. The King of England presented her with the gold medal. I'm very proud of you, he said. Congratulations. Then King George VI shook Alice's hand. The End